Anti-Semitism is on the rise in America and around the world. And the question is, is what are we doing about it? It seems like that the Christian church has actually joined in on this battlefront. And instead of supporting Israel, the rhetoric that is growing is just becoming obscene. It's time. It is time that the Christian church recognizes who she really is. It is time for the bride of Mashiach to stand up and face the attack on Israel head on. If you don't do something about it, you will find yourself in a modern day exodus in a way you would rather not be. What side will you stand on? What place will you take in this fight? I'd like to take you uh, to the scripture here and read to you a passage I've shared with you already recently and something I feel that it's important that you hear again. This is found in Genesis, the chapter 25, or verse 23. It says, And Hashem said unto her, speaking to Rebekah, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. How many times have we mistakenly through the centuries here, have misplaced what this scripture has, has been said. The, 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 whether it be in Christology, uh, the Christian faith, whatever you want to uh, put it, even in the Jewish faith, this passage has been so misinterpreted it's not even funny. But, but you know, I can't blame anybody because the thing is, it's kind of like when people quote Nostradamus and they try to figure out what the what his uh, quatrains all mean and they're trying to figure something out that is that is he had to hide himself for the sake of his own life that it generally is after it comes to pass that you begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together and so that's kind of the where we're at right here it was actually uh and i've said this to you guys many a times uh from a sister that contacted me and said to me that nine months of negotiations that John Kerry is doing right now uh, can easily be seen in uh, in the scripture of, uh, I believe it was Micah, the fourth chapter. Let me just get that there. And the sister said, you know, I just, I couldn't help but think, uh, yes, here we go right here. In Micah chapter four, let's start with verse nine. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is the counselor perished? No pangs have taken thee as a excuse me. Uh, for pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shall you go forth out of the city, and you shall dwell in the field, and you shall go even. To Babylon, there shall thou be delivered, and uh, there uh, Hashem shall redeem you from the from the hand of your enemies. Now, wow, and this is exactly. I mean, John Kerry, and when he brought forth the negotiation process for the dividing of the land of Israel. He, did it, he said that they would do a nine-month negotiations. And of course, that started last month. We're on a countdown, friends. I believe that this negotiation is what's going to settle everything. This is what's going to bring judgment on the United States. This is what's going to bring um, the anti-Semitism on the rise that it is. There are so many things that I want to tell you. I mean, truly, it's a Vatican agenda. But don't worry. God has Russia right there in the background waiting. Uh, the, other, the other night, we were on the radio broadcast there um, uh, with Jason and Phil. 
with Revelation News Radio. You can check out the archive. It's at blogtalkradio.com. I do have a link to that, and, and so it should take you to the right uh, Blog Talk Radio, Revelation News. Anyway, look up the one about the Tex Mars and why, uh, listen to that, that broadcast there. It's a three-hour broadcast, but we had uh, uh, Pastor Paul, uh, Paul Begley on there. Uh, it was a pleasure getting to speak with him. Also, uh, a surprise visitor that came on was uh, uh, Alan, um, Alan Lamont from Australia. And Alan says in there, he says, Russia, which I've always known this myself, was raised up by God to destroy the Vatican. So the, it is a Vatican agenda because Satan wants to sit in the temple of God and be worshipped as if he were God. And the only way he can do that is he's got to have that religious figurehead to do so. And the Pope is that man that he can do that with. You know, the Bible says that it's the number of a man. And that man sits in the temple of God. First, I think it's First Thessalonians there in the Christian Bible. Sits in the temple of God, worshipped as if he were God, exalting above himself above all that is called God. So there's going to be a third temple built. It's not for our people. It's not for the Jewish people. This is going to be built merely for the Antichrist. And, and you know, Alan made an interesting comment because he said the Arab nations will join up with the Russians to go and destroy the Vatican. I thought that was interesting when he said that. Now, I know for a fact that the Russians have it in for the Vatican because when Ronald Reagan was president, he had a holy alliance, as it was called, as in Time magazine, uh, the holy alliance, where him and Pope John Paul the the sixth there made a, uh, made an alliance to go in there and topple the Soviet Union, and they were successful in doing so. So Russia has it in for well, it has it in for the United States as well because they had their big hand in that as well. But the Catholic Church was a huge player in this, uh, toppling the Soviet Union. Now, let me get, I don't want to get too far off into this. I'm really wanting to take you guys because it's important that you realize what's happening. We are at the final exodus. And as much as I have thought to myself that Israel, this is Israel's final exodus. I write in the book Yom Suf, Israel's final exodus, when I speak about the redemption of Israel. Because we have in Revelation, let me just take you to this real quick. By the way, Exodus 15, uh, I'm going to take you there just real fast. When God takes Moses, he brings the children of Israel out and they come to the other side. And uh, on, on the other side of Yam Suf, the, the, the Red Sea, or the Gulf of Aqaba in this case here. And it says here, Then Moses sang, excuse me, Then sang Moses unto the children of Israel this song unto to Hashem, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath uh, triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength in the so in, in song. Now, in Hebrew, it says, Ashura, Ladonaga, See, it is a future event. And many of the sages realize that this event is yet to take place. It hasn't happened as of yet. And it is, it is about to take place, though. This is going to be when, Mo, you know, this is one of the reasons why I realize that Moses actually returns with Elijah, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Moshe. They come back as the two witnesses, the two olive branches, the two anointed ones of Zechariah. Uh, as well, and it's got to be at the time of a building of the third temple because clearly the Christian Bible notes John says the angel give him a read like unto a rod. He said, Measure the temple, measure the altar, but leave out the outer court for it's given unto the Gentiles. So a temple is being built, the Gentiles are going to get the outer court, just exactly what the, the Vatican wants that outer court. See. Because they're going to build the third temple, and I believe alongside the Dome of the Rock. This is going to be part of the negotiation. That's why they say, peace, peace, and there is no peace. And of course, the scripture said, and sudden destruction comes. So they'll get the temple built. The Antichrist will get to get in there and sit on that. He'll, he'll, he'll defame the temple. The Jews will think it's for them. They're going to offer their sacrifice, start sacrificial process again, only to have someone looks like it's going to be the Pope that we have now that will step in there and say that he is Mashiach or perhaps someone else. I have no idea. I can't say that for sure, friends. I'm just telling you that we're at a serious hour when we're, when we're looking at this. But Moses, this song is in the future. And also we find in another place where God says to Moses, if they do not believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Nowhere did the children of Israel ever really believe Moses. 
It was the children that made it into the promised land. And my friend, this is why I say we are at the final exodus. As Moses, they came out a mixed multitude. And that's what we have today, a mixed multitude. I used to really just think that because Israel is going to recognize uh, their Messiah, Mashiach, and who he really is. And of course, you guys already know, I believe that Yeshua is the Mashiach. So he is the Messiah, and Israel is going to recognize that. So I would look at, in Revelation, by the way, and I'll just real quick take you there. In Revelation uh, chapter 15, um, this is where we see, again, Moses had to have came back, because watch what it says here. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now, I just can't help but think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when I think about this fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses. Now Moses says, Adonai, I will sing unto the Lord. That he's gotten victory over the haughty one and over his rider, over the horse and his rider. The Hebrew, we translate that normally as haughty one. But the, you know, speaking of the, of the rider there. But he gets victory over, and, and, and notice now, let, let me back up again. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. And they stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the, of the Lamb. They, Israel finally recognizes who her Messiah is. Isn't that interesting? Now Moses, though, is not with them. But undoubtedly, he came back and teaches the song. No wonder why God tells Moses, if they don't believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. It's because he comes back. Now, people, last night we were talking about Tex Mars and, and his new book. And, 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 uh, and gosh, friends, I, I, I want to tell you something. When, when I when I speak to you about Texas book and, and I want to pull up uh, so, some information on on Texas book here uh, because what really concerns me is um, I, I I don't want to give this man sales of his book by so many people bringing up his his new book here but uh but but nonetheless it is causing a rise of anti-semitism like never before in the christian community and i i just cannot imagine i mean alex jones has basically endorsed tex mars and in, in his new book that he has out um, it is, uh, gosh, let's see here. The name of his book is called DNA Science and the Jewish Bloodline by Tex Mars. And he's got a, the Star of David in red instead of blue, you know, just to be arrogant about it. Uh, he shows a DNA coding in there. And, and the funny thing is, is the whole world, Christian world, this is really bringing out who's who and who's on what side. I can't help but think that when Moses first came out of Egypt, the Bible said it was a mixed multitude. You know, that was both Gentile and Jew mixed up into this that came out. It wasn't just all Jews. And, and many a, a, a Jewish uh, scholar has recognized the fact that not all the Jews came out either. But the majority of Israel did come out. They followed Moses. They saw the greatest signs in all the history, the plagues and the, and the pouring out of all kinds of, uh, of, of disasters, the parting of the water, the, 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 the water turning to blood, the locust, the hail, the fire. 
And do we not realize that when the two witnesses come, they're going to torment the people on the earth with these same plagues? And you have an exodus sitting before you. And so this exodus, I'm realizing more and more, this is not just an exodus for the Jews. It's a mixed multitude that comes out. This is where God is able to separate and to find out who's who. You remember when Corin Dathan stood up against Moses and God says to him, he says, you know, God, excuse me, Moses says to the people, he says, whoever's on the side of Hashem, come and stand here on our side. And God opened up the earth and swallowed, I mean, swallowed them up. I mean, my gosh, friends, do you realize how serious of an hour we're living in? God is not here. This is no time to play church. And, and good people, people that have stood with Israel, that are following all kinds of nonsense. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to call names in this video, and I, and I don't, and I say this in respect to these people. I mean, Tex Mars, if I'm going to pick on Tex, I need to say things about other people because I really believe that these people mean well. You have the only one that I personally know of that I'm friends with on Facebook is Rob Skiba. And Rob, he seems to be a good brother, he seems to really love the Lord. But I really believe that he's gotten off because of trying to take scripture and not understanding the prophetic implications that are laying there and has gotten off track. Take Leviticus 26. One of the, quote, the quotations there, and I'll see if I can't just pull that up for you real quick there, uh, that, that Rob looks at in Leviticus 26, and that is that uh, where it says here that all the families... Um, see if I can pull that just right there. The families... Of the earth, excuse me, not of the earth uh, families, and this this is when this is when Israel would be coming back into the homeland, and but let's see, I think I had it there. Hang on one second, friends here. Uh, they shall be for the I, I, gosh, I forget exactly where this is at here, but anyway, it speaks about all the families that would go back. And because it says all the families, I just caught it where a little brief part there where Rob was quoting this. He said then, but all the families that, that go back, they don't believe. He talks about how that the majority of Israel is atheist, unbelievers. It's a secular society. And it's a small percentage that really does believe. That's no different than when the children of Israel went out of Egypt. And, that, and this is where... I even see that my brother here, he, he kind of got off on that. He really he thinks that when Israel went out, from, uh, went out uh, from Egypt that they were all believers. They were not all believers. That was the whole point for the 40 years that they spent in the wilderness. God was beginning to separate and find out who really believed him and who didn't believe him. When you come right down to it, you had Caleb and Joshua. I mean, my friends, do you realize the things that are going on? The families... To go there, it only is that the whole purpose for God having that scripture there is just like in Zechariah, uh, and, and I, I definitely know where that's at. That's in Zechariah chapter 12, where he talks about uh, uh, in Zechariah chapter 12. Let me just get this for you here. And he says, uh, uh, God says to Zechariah that, uh, and the land shall mourn. Verse 11, every family apart, the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart and their wives apart, the family of Shemai apart and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. See, every family. That doesn't mean that every single family in Israel is going to all of a sudden start believing that Yeshua is Mashiach. What God is trying to show us here is that we don't know what tribal order we belong to. This is why the scripture is written thus. It doesn't mean that every family uh, uh, that is in Israel today that is Jewish is going to suddenly be believers. 
And this is how it's so easy to misconstrue the word of God. It's so easy for us to get off the word. And then another thing that you, that you can see here plainly in the scripture here is that it's Orthodox Jews. Do you realize that you do not have this custom in secular Jews? The very Jews that most Christians are bashing in their anti-Semitic rhetoric on, on, on YouTube, it's their custom that separates the men and the women. We separated, I mean, I, I used to go to an Orthodox synagogue, still go to one. The men and the women, we have a wall, we, it divides, it divides the congregation. The men sit on one side, the women sit on another side. And when they begin to mourn because they recognize that Yeshua was indeed Moshiach, they still have the custom. They mourn separately from one another. Why? Because they recognize Yeshua to be Moshiach, but Moshe has not had the opportunity to help them to understand that the laws have been fulfilled. Don't condemn them. You know, the thing is, as you don't understand, is that the cost that the Jewish people have paid to bring the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach to the world. It's been a tremendous cost. The scripture says, if you sow to the wind, and I'm going to pull it up, there's some things that I really want you to know. Gosh, let me, I'm, I'm trying to remember how this is. Maybe it soweth. Ah, wind. Maybe whirlwind. I, I'm just sitting here. I've got it on uh, my the Bible here. Um, but anyway, there's a scripture that says, "If you if you sow to the wind, you shall reap a whirlwind." And that's what I that's what I'm looking for. Here we go. I, I think I found it here. For yes, it's in Hosea. Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, For they have sown the wind, they shall reap the whirlwind. Now, oh my gosh. The, the wind is the word ruach in Hebrew. It's exactly the, the, the Hebrew word that is used right here. It's ruach, which is a spirit. And to sow it is to plant it. Now, how can you plant the wind in the ground? When Moshiach was to come, we have to remember, even as Jews, we know as Jews, that the Jews that were there in the day when Yeshua was on the earth, they were trying to figure out how to get back to the tree of life. It was a huge debate. They couldn't figure this out. And we know that that debate was there because Yeshua comes along and he tells them, I am the way. The scripture says, La Shemaah, to guard the way. The Derek, Eitz Chaim, to guard the way to the tree of life, which is Hashem's life. Yehaveh. It was his life. See, that way had to be guarded. And then all of a sudden Yeshua comes along and he says, I am that way. It was through the shedding of the blood of the sacrifice. Remember, when a sacrifice is offered, the life goes out of the sacrifice. The blood atones for our sins. But that life is meant, is showing that the life that comes out is supposed to be able to come back upon you. How do I know this? Because it's written in Genesis. When God opened up Adam's side, he opened up when he cut his side open. Do you not realize that blood come from his side? He was doing surgery. Then he takes from Minish, he takes from that man, the, the Ish, Aleph Yod Sheen, take the Yod there and move it up and out of there for just a second. You have Aleph Sheen, which is fire. The Yod is the first letter of the divine name. He calls her Isha, the last letter in her name. Aleph Shin He, the last letter in her name, shows the two together. Yod He makes God's name. 
And when he opened up Adam's side, that blood began to pour from his side because he was doing surgery. And he took part of her body, a part of his body, in order to be able to make the DNA of her body. But it wasn't just that. The blood was the atonement. The reason why the shedding of the blood was because his blood was spilled on the ground in order to bring forth his wife. But when he brought her forth, he brought from him the Ruach HaKadosh. Ruach HaKadosh was coming out of him from the Minish, from the spirit of living God that was inside of him. Why? Because God, Nishma Chaim, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of God's own life was breathed into him in a plural form. So Eve was inside of him. And people have always wondered, why do we offer a sacrificial lamb? Why is there blood? Because when the fall came, in order to bring forth his bride, his side was torn open and the blood poured out on the ground as a sacrifice. He laid there as a lamb. He laid there willingly. He was put into a deep sleep. And God taken from his side, his bride. Nowhere do you see that God ever had to breathe into the nostrils of Eve, the Holy Spirit. Never did he say to her, Nishmar Chaim or Nishmar Chai. She came forth filled with the Holy Ghost. No wonder why when John the Baptist came as a forerunner, showing that it was the bride of Moshiach. John was that bride as a representation like Eve was. So therefore, he received the Holy Ghost when he was in the womb of his mother. Showing that Eve came out filled with the Holy Ghost. But Adam's blood was poured on the ground. God closed him back up. The surgery was done. He was the lamb. But when the sin came, God knew that he would have to repeat the process. He had told them, multiply, replenish the earth. God's word will not fail. And so God's word set in motion to, 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 re, to the, the procreation to be able to replenish the earth. But the problem was, the Eis Chaim, because the sin comes in, now he has to guard that way of life. Why? Because God cannot allow the life to come upon sinful nature now. And this is one of the reasons why you brethren that are so against the, 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 the concept that God made Eve equal with her husband. You need to really pay attention to the scripture. God is prophetic when he speaks to Eve and he says to her, you will turn to your husband. Go back to the original translations back 2,000 years ago when they were when the, when the scribes then were translating the Hebrew language. He, they said, turn to your husband. Dushatecha. And forgive my pronunciation if it's not the best in the world. But the thing is, God said, and he shall woo over you. Not by divine decree, God was not rewarding Adam because of his sin. And I know there's, there's many that have the concept. I've seen it recently again, I think with, with Chuck Missler that was saying, he made the comment that, you know, Adam was doing this as a type of Christ going after his bride. You know, if he was truly a type of Christ in this, the only thing that I have to question in this when I ask you this question here is then why then when God comes and questions, why doesn't he show the true type of Christ? Because Christ comes and stands for his bride. Mashiach will stand for his wife. Adam, on the other hand, when God comes and asks uh, an answer for what happened, he says, the woman that you give me did it. He doesn't stand for her. So we have to ask the question, is he truly doing it as a type of Mashiach? It seems to beg to differ. But the thing is, is then that blood that Adam, his blood from his own side. You know, the funny thing is, I never knew this before until what I'm telling you now. I always wondered why was it blood? 
And I know there's a lot of other ideas out there, but now I know what the truth of the matter is. Because where did the blood fall from, from Moshiach, when Yeshua was on the cross? It was from his side as well. As I've said to you, for my Jewish brethren that are listening to this message right now, and, and you, the Christian people out there that are listening to this video, if you have fallen into that Korah camp that is starting to deny the Jews that are in the homeland today because of such nonsense as the Khazar doctrine, and I'm going to deal with that in just a minute for you. you will find yourself in a Korah and Dathan camp. Do you not realize that the majority of the Jews that were, that were in that land, the Khazarian land, were escaping the Persian anti-Semitism that was going on back then and they went there? Just because the royalty converted to Judaism and what is wrong with the royalty converting to Judaism? And we're going to get into the DNA evidence that's nothing but flawed mess. Because, by the way, there's quite a few geneticists that have already really slammed it. And they slam it based on true facts. When Moses smote that rock, and I know a lot of Christians, you remember the part where God says for him to speak to the rock. In the beginning of the wilderness journey, God tells Moses, take with you the elders of Israel. They're arguing whether or not God is among them. Let that one soak deep for those that do not believe that God is amongst the children of Israel today. And that you say that they're not really Jews. My good friend Gershon Solomon, I used to live right across the street from him in Israel. And in his own testimony, in 1967, when they took the Temple Mount, he said a man comes up there, presents himself as if he were a, a, a tourist guide, speaking to them in English, and begins to show them all the things that are around the Temple Mount, took them inside the Dome of the Rock and said, this is where the Holy of Holies once stood. And Gershon with several other friends were there, soldiers that had fought in the battle to liberate Israel and all the miracles that took place for that to happen. And you don't think God is with them? Even the Arabs have to admit that God is with them. Their testimony in the battle said that God was with Israel. So what are you going to do about that testimony? The people that hate us admit it. But anyway, this man says to, to them, or finally, excuse me, Gershon asked him the question. He said, you know, we appreciate you, your kindness in showing us around, but why would you do this? And then the man answered him, I have been sent from the presence of Almighty God to tell you that all that you are seeing today is a sign for you to let you know that the God of Israel is once again dwelling among his people. This man turned around and vanished right before their presence with three witnesses. Do I believe his testimony? Absolutely, I do. We have witness upon witness upon witness. And remember, as I said to you, Moses, when Moses, when God said to Moses, go and smite the rock, Take the elders of Israel with you. And the whole argument was whether or not God was among them or not. History is repeating itself again, my friends. That is why I tell you, you are in your final exodus, Christian and Jew alike. You know, there was a mixed multitude that went out. You know, one of the reasons was, was because there was a, several, quite a few Gentiles that was standing with the God of Israel. Not the Egyptians, though. Not the anti-Semites. But now today, the argument is, is God really among them or not? It's bad enough to say that their, that their DNA is not Jewish. 
And I'm sitting here getting, I'm being sent all kinds of ministers, Christian evangelical ministers that are taking this DNA research and saying that we are the true, true ones that really have a right to the land. Do you not see the Vatican agenda in this? Did not Daniel say, let me read that up for you. You know, I quote a lot of these a lot of times and I don't read it to you and you really need to know it. Ah. Oh. In the book of Daniel, he speaks about them. It's, it's right here. This is speaking of the prince that is to come. This is in Daniel chapter 11. This covenant that they're working on. Oh, wow. Vatican is deep into the pocket of this one. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. You know, I see, I see, I see three men involved in this process already. John Kerry, the Pope, Francis, really is the main one, because if you ever notice, Shimon Perez said if there's anyone that can bring peace in the Middle East right now, he said, Pope Francis, you are the man. I hate that expression, you're, you're the man. There's only one man, and that's Yeshua. I, and for years I've said that. People say, oh, you're the man. I said, no, Yeshua is the man. Jesus is the man. We're just the little guys. Anyway, and with the arms of a flood shall they over, excuse me, shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant and by the way, the prince is from Rome. We know that because the Bible said that the prince that shall come shall be of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Titus, the Roman general, destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. So therefore, that prince that shall come is definitely going to be a Roman. Doesn't mean that he has to be Roman blood descent. It speaks of the Vatican. The prince that shall come is the last pope. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. My Palestinian friends, those of you that are friends with Israel, those of you that are true Christians that are Palestinian, my brothers, you are my brothers that are to the true Christian Palestinians. Do you not recognize that they are using you? The Vatican is using you as a puppet. No wonder why the Arabs join up with Russia to destroy the Vatican. They finally wake up to that fact. But anyway, it's, it's, it's just used to get in there to be able to get the third temple. And there again, my Jewish brethren, do we not know that the temple that comes down from God out of heaven has nothing to do with this unearthly being made temple? How have we misconstrued the word of God? The temple that they're wanting to build to get us all excited about a third temple will be the Pope putting it. And yes, he will open up the catacombs and release to us those famous artifacts that were taken back. He sways in the Palestinians to fall for it. He's got, he's got all the Arab world falling for it right now, but they, wake, they will wake up. He's got the Jewish people falling for it. Gershon, my brother, if you hear this video, I beg you, my brother. You said to me in the past, my brother, that I was like your son to you. And I adjure you, my brother. I adjure you by the name of the God of Israel, Hashem. Do not, my brother, do not take part with that scheme there. I know you know better, my brother. And I say, my father. You know, the scripture does say, does it not say in Malachi, they shall turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers. The, what is the heart of the children? The heart of the children finally wake up wanting Moshiach. The heart of the fathers was the, to see Moshiach. That was what they all longed for, was the Messiah. Why? Because the only way to complete the redemption was to have Messiah. When Moses smote that rock, 
Like I said, the argument was, is God among us? It's the argument today that they're doing in Israel now. It was the argument 2,000 years ago when Yeshua walked the shores of Galilee and was there in Israel. They argued, is God really among us or not? And he was in tabernacled in the Son of God, in Moshiach. Could God become man? Yes. He became a man when he stood there at the presence of Abraham and Moshe said it was Hashem. We need to wake up. We've got to wake up. Now, when that rock was smitten, the water came forth. That water was showing the waters of life. It was a representation of the Spirit of God. No wonder when Yeshua was on earth and he spoke to the Samaritan woman. And he said, if you knew it was that was speaking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. And I'll give you water that you don't have to come here. He was speaking of the waters of life. That's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He showed you that he was the Eitz Chaim. That's why he breathes on his uh, disciples before his death. And he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. <sighs> See, he does like that. They didn't receive the Holy Ghost right then. He was giving them a sign to know that he was the one in the Garden of Eden that breathed in the nostrils of Adam. Do you not get it? Can you not see what I'm telling you? Adam became a sacrifice. He was willing to lay down and bring forth his bride. And then in type, God had to do the same because sin came in. And so now required another sacrifice. That's when Adam was a type of Moshiach. When he was willing to lay his life down in order to bring forth his bride. In that regard, yes, he does type Mashiach. He was willing at that point to lay his life down. There he was, a type of Mashiach to bring forth his bride. I believe that he was troubled. I believe that in his heart he longed for the fellowship When God says it is not good, when God says it is not good, there's because there's a problem in the garden. It is not good for the man to be alone. God knew. You know why God knew? Because he spent an eternity nearly dwelling with all of his thoughts in his heart and in his soul with his wife inside of him. And then one day, God, when he makes the creation and he puts this creation here and he's making everything, all of a sudden he says, Elohim Then God said, Let not let there be but creation. Eternity becomes tangible. And God makes a tangible, he makes himself tangible so he can have fellowship with the creation that he's about to bring forth. This is incredible. How can we overlook what's going on? My gosh. So when Yeshua, when God brought him on the earth, he had to bring another lamb, he had to bring another Adam. So when Yeshua was saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was trying to get you to understand to watch something, just like he said to the Samaritan woman, I'll give you that water. And when his side was ripped open, both blood and water came from his side, just like the temple sacrifices. Does not Rabbi Orly say that the temple is laid out like the human body? And the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies is right where the, the heart, the human heart sits. And when the sacrifices are being offered, and they forced the Gihon up into the, up into the Temple Mount and the water would wash that blood and that blood would go out the side of the Temple Mount there and it was blood and water coming out separated, showing that the water washing away the sins. No wonder why that the baptism is required. 
The sacrifice is washed. Then the blood has to be washed away. And the blood was coming out. Because when God tore Adam's side open, opened up his side, do you not think that blood didn't pass, come out of his side as well? And then he put Yeshua into a deep sleep and he opened up his side. And when that blood and water came out, the blood came out as an atonement for his bride. And the water came out it's a sign that the Spirit of God, the Eitz Chaim, was inside of this man called Yeshua. Yeshua. Yahweh's salvation. That is our way of redemption. This is the way that we have to accept now, I want to go with you. Let me, let me just share with you some things real quick. To show you, to see which side you're going to stand on. Now I'm going to speak to you as Christian believers. Before I get into that, let me real quick. Text Mars and his book of nonsense. Saying that the majority of the Jews that are in the land today are not really Jews, they're Khazars. Or Khazars, whatever you want to call them. Because the majority of the Jews in Israel today are Ashkenazi. The German descent Jews. You know, it's so ludicrous to begin with. I mean, my father is a Sephardic Sai. All the Danun family. If you ever search the Danuns that are Jews, there are a lot of them that converted to Christianity, so did my father's side. The Inquisition calls that. For you that are Danuns that might see this video that are Christians, look up the Danuns that are Jewish. This is your relatives. You've always wondered, well, you knew you came from France, but you couldn't ever quite figure out your lineage. You never could understand why you had the noon in your name. That's for those of you that did convert to Christianity that don't know nothing about your roots. You were Vinun originally. Your name was changed to Dinun because they didn't want anyone to know that you were Jewish. And that's what happened. Isn't it funny how many of you, you actually use the word D? Noon. You don't say da noon like the French do. You say D. You know why? Because in the in the Hebrew language, Joshua was not ben noon. That's why you're not de noon. They both mean the same of noon or son of noon. But Joshua was be noon. This is why you still carry the D in your name around to this day, and you wonder why you do that. You're carrying around a Jewish tradition and don't even know it. And Joshua was named thus instead of saying Ben because the rabbis say it was because he had divine revelation or divine inspiration of the words of Moshe, the words of Moses. God anointed him differently. And that's why he had that name. Anyway, we have all kinds of Jews that are in Israel today, not just Ashkenazi, but the Ashkenazi, let me just share with you a little bit about this report, Tex Mars and, and, and his book. By the way, Tex, what Tex is actually doing, he's taking, um, oh gosh, uh, Ella Hike's study that he does. And Ella Hike, by the way, uh, he is, um, he, he claims that the Khazars converted to Judaism and that there is a DNA link between the the royal, royal family of the Khazars and the Jewish people. Now, there could be a link there. We don't say that it's not because there were so many Jewish women that were ravished to begin with that we do have all kinds of mixtures in there. Even before, it, when Israel, back during David, for example, uh, married a, uh, a, um, a non-Jewish woman. Uh, Boaz married Ruth, the Moabitess. Uh, we have all through our family history uh, as Judaism, uh, Joseph married uh, Asenath, who was also an Egyptian girl. So, and so that makes me half Egyptian. So for those of you out there that are Egyptian, then you're my half brother as well. So i uh, just like to see you do like the Jews that came out were the part of the mixed multitude. I'd like to see you come out believing that Yeshua is Mashiach as well. So um, we have a link there. But anyway, uh, Ella Hike, in his uh, in his DNA, he says uh, one of the one of the points here that is made. And I'll just read a little bit to you here. Said that uh, Khan points out a number of serious problems with Ella Hike's study. Uh, and by the way, Khan, if you want to read about his works there, 
Uh, he does it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an article typed, Ashkenazi Jews are probably not descended from the Khazars. Uh, and that is in the gene ex, uh, expression site is where you would find that at. Uh, but Khan points out in a, a number of serious problems with Ella Hayek's study, most notably that the uh, Caucasians, or the Caucasians, that's probably where we get the white part from there as far as that word there, component that is being detected in this paper may simply be indignant, indig, indig, oh gosh, you guys, you guys know I'm from Alabama, uh, indignitous, uh, indignitous Middle Eastern ancestral element, which has now been somewhat displaced northward in its model frequency due to the expansion of the, uh, of the Arabs. In the, in the fast changing world of genetics, it's, it has now become common for scientists to issue contradictory reports on the topic. And at the end of the day, what really matters is how Jewish uh, uh, super, 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 gosh, that's another tough word, supermacist behave and how this behavior has become constant throughout history. And that's true. Because you have to remember, the Khazars to begin with, this is, this is around 800 CE in the Common Era. But one of the things that this, this man here does in the article here, he brings out, he just shows some of the dispersions here. You have uh, Carthage in 250 CE. Alexandria, the Jews were expelled in 415 CE. In France, they were ex expelled in 554 CE. Spain, 612 CE. Italy, 855 CE. Germany, several times starting in 1012 CE. Uh, uh, Mainz from France again in 1182 CE, England in 1290 CE, Switzerland in 1348 CE, Hungary 1349 CE, Belgium in 1370 CE, Austria in 1421 CE, the Netherlands in 1442 CE, Spain in 1492 CE, and so on and so on. And by the way, for the Danun family that converted to Christianity, your Christianity dates back and stops at the Spanish Inquisition in the 1400s. Just in case you're curious, that's why you can't seem to get your roots to go back any further. You should be looking in the synagogues. You'll find you're related to the same Danunes, the same common ancestry, the same common names, everything. It's all the same. Um, and the reason I know that is because we, we know, well, we, in my family, we know the ancestry on our, on our side. Uh, but anyway, I, just, I do know there's a lot of Danunes out there that, that, don't, that don't know this. And so I figured it, for their sake, I would bring that up. Uh, my mother's side, though, Ashkenazi. Ah, oh, text. So I guess my mother's not a Jew, right? Oh, wow. Well, there's a lot more stuff we could go into here that would really blow the socks off of Texas information here. Um, but I will save that there for another time. Another genetic study led by Doran uh, Bihar found that despite the admixture from local populations, uh, auto, auto sm uh, small genetic samples from the Ashkenazi Jews, Caucasian Jews, Middle Eastern Jews, North African Jews and Sephardi Jews from a relatively tight genetic cluster which overlaps with Samaritans and Israeli Druze, which is strongly indicative of common Levante ancestry. That's Jewish ancestry, by the way. And Ashkenazis follow that group too. So gosh, you know, I wouldn't want to go write a book like that with only part of the truth unless you're part of the uh, Vatican agenda. So now, real quick, I want to go now with you into the Christian place where you need to be as you enter into this exodus time frame uh, and by the way i really want to get into a lot of things for rob skiba's sake and, and i can't do it in this video maybe some of the things i've said here will help rob my brother uh, I, I really have a heart for him I, I really believe that i believe that he'll come out of that i really do um, but let me just say this here israel has to be in her homeland in order to recognize who the Messiah is. Even though we do know the Rothschilds gave millions, imagine how much the Egyptians gave to the Israelis. See, God is not so much concerned where that money comes from. The same with Abraham when he let his wife go off to be with, uh, uh, with the king at that time there. And that king was a good man. He even says to God, you know my heart. I, I, I didn't know. He said, this man says that this is his sister, and she says, this is my brother. And the Lord says to him, I know the integrity of your heart. But he said, unless you restore him his wife and have him pray for you, you and your entire nation is gone. God is very biased when it comes to the children of Israel. And also, let me point out as well, when 
Jacob deceived his father in order to get the birthright. And Jacob, and excuse me, and Isaac, when he's giving the blessing over, blessing over Jacob, he said, whoever blesses you will be blessed and whoever curses you will be cursed. Now, shortly thereafter, Esau comes in and he wants a blessing, but he can't get a blessing because Isaac tells him straight up, I have blessed him, and indeed he sh truly shall be blessed. The, the blessing does not apply to Israel once she becomes Israel, a prince with God. We do know the time has to come where Israel had to wrestle all night with God, with Mashiach, to find out who he really is. But to bless Israel or to curse Israel now holds a penalty before God, before he wrestles with God all night. Isaac said he truly is blessed. He even has a supplanter. So be careful what you say about God's anointed. When Obama was brave enough in the White House to take Netanyahu, many of you out there say he's a Jesuit and he's this or he's that and everything. You know, if you said that about Shimon Perez, I might could go with you there because the way he's in bed with the Vatican and selling out the nation of Israel to split the nation. Yes, he is Ahab. And if I were to say he was lineage where it came from, Ahab would have to be where I said, or Judas one. I don't know which, but he definitely come from one or the other. And I would have to say Ahab. But when it comes to Netanyahu, Mike Evans, and I don't care what anybody thinks about Mike Evans, God led that man to Israel to anoint Benjamin Netanyahu before he went into politics to be prime minister over Israel. He did not know what he was doing. But when he went to the Netanyahu's house, not knowing who he was, just to comfort the family at the loss of his brother Jonathan, he grabs a cruise of oil when Netanyahu walks in the room and runs over there and pours it on his head and says, Thus saith Hashem, you will not be king or prime minister over Israel but once but twice. Tell me he's not anointed king. And I know that people say, God doesn't, he's not going to have a king like that. Yes, he will. Because let me tell you something, Israel is on her way home. The way she left God is the way she has to go back. Redemption has to go in reverse. The way you sin and leave God is your way back to God. If you go out and you wrong your neighbor and you expect to just come out there and repent to God for what you did to your neighbor and think God will take you in. No, God said first, go restore to your neighbor what you did. Israel forsook God when they rejected Samuel the prophet. And then God did give them some godly kings. He gave them David. He gave them Solomon. And they also had an Ahab. And then finally, God sent Mashiach, and we crucified him. We didn't do the dirty work, that's true. Neither did, neither did the children of Israel, neither did the Joseph's brothers really do the dirty work. They sold him out. But the ones that really did the dirty work were the Romans. That's why you have your day coming too. That's why the Vatican is descendants of the Romans. Oh my gosh. Do you guys realize what I'm talking about? You need to know what side you're on. When Netanyahu, so, okay, so let me show you. God has Israel on her way back home. When Benjamin Netanyahu was elected prime minister the first time, I knew it would not work. I knew it when they ran to the street screaming, Benny, king of the Jews. See, we, after, we, after Mashiach was crucified, then in 70 AD, our people were dispersed to all the world. There's your story of Ruth, by the way. There's the law of Moses says, do not glean the corners of the field, for it's given to the Gentiles to glean and for the poor among you. You ever wonder why the poor... He wants to make sure that we all have a part. So even if you're poor, even if you send three pennies to help return the Jews to their homeland, you have a part in that.
This is why God gave the law to Moses not to glean the four corners of the field. This is why you have the story of Ruth, a Mobonitis. Naomi is a type of the diaspora of Israel after she had been dispersed throughout another out into the foreign lands. She comes back. She suffers a tremendous loss. We see the story of Hosea. After their affliction, they shall seek me earnestly. In the third day, they shall be gathered again. We are in the third day. We are being gathered again. And so God brings Naomi home. And Ruth the Moabitess, notice she had two daughters. I love it. One talked really big. Oh, I love you. I love you, Naomi. I want to stay with you. And Naomi says, go to your people. And she finally gives in and goes. Ruth, on the other hand, doesn't. Ruth will not let her go for no reason. Notice also, Ruth believes in the God of Israel. That's an interesting point in itself. She sticks by her mother-in-law with everything in her. And then God shows that beautiful picture right there when they come back to Israel. And Naomi says, don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. Because the Lord is looking bitterly upon me. Israel has come to her homeland and she has been looked upon bitterly, it seems like. And yet the world says it's pleasant. At least until now. And then God says to, or has Ruth go to the field of Boaz. And she begins to reap. You know why the field of Boaz? Because Yeshua, the gospel fields. He said, look, the harvest is ripe. The laborers are few. Pray that they'll send laborers into my harvest. That was a worldwide harvest. And bring my people home. Bring my people home. And Ruth began to glean the four corners because it was left for the Gentiles. It is the Gentiles' responsibility to stick close to Israel regardless of what she has suffered. Stay there with her. Glean and find the lost of Israel that are in the four corners of the earth and bring them back home again. That is your call. That is what God called you to do. Notice Ruth would bring the grain in and then she would pour it out of her apron on the floor in the presence of Naomi. And what have Gentiles been doing? Of course, the Jewish agencies as well doing the same. But what have the Gentiles been doing? They have been bringing home the Jews And Rob, my brother, you say not Delta, not the Rothschilds, and I know you named some other ones there. Brother, the story of Ruth has been speaking it the entire time how we come home. It is your responsibility. This is God's way of doing it. In fact, Boaz, how many times does everybody want to type, especially in Christianity, you type Boaz as Mashiach, as Yeshua, you know, my brother Rob, do you realize that if you don't count, if you if you take the way you're taking it, literally that, that Hashem, that the God of Israel, literally, he's got to be the one that picks us up literally and brings us all back into the land and sets us down in Israel, that that is his way of doing it? God said to Moses, I have come down to deliver my people. And then he said, what? And I am sending you. But he starts off with a personal pronoun. But the thing is, is God is the one that is doing it, yes. But he also chooses an avenue to do it, to carry it out. He carries it out with a man with a stick. My God. My brother, please look at this. As As I share with you these things, look at what I'm telling you. Because you will have to take Boaz and you're going to have to change the type. He could not be a type of Yeshua if you don't recognize what it represents. 
And then what does Boaz say to Ruth when he finds favor with her? Notice too, he tells her to go out secretly so nobody knows that you've been here. Hmm. Doesn't Yeshua say, do not do your alms before man? A lot of, I mean, I'm, gosh, I'm getting things tonight I've never thought of before. And no, I don't have sensations, but I guarantee you one thing, it's still God. Wow. I do get the sensations too now. Don't get me wrong, you know, but I know that God, He does things like that do happen. They do happen. But He says to Ruth, I've seen, it's been told of me, all that you've done for your mother in law, Naomi. Ruth, who represents the bride of Mashiach finds favor in the sight of Boaz because of her kindness to Israel. Remember when I said to you a little bit ago, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna save I'm gonna save Abigail till last. Let me real quick take you through Esther. They say that the divine name of God is not in the book of Esther. And there is a reason behind that. It's because the king of As Ahasuerus actually is a type of Hashem in this story. Vashti is a type of Israel. And you have to remember, when some people try to tell me, well, Vashti couldn't be a type of Israel. Abraham was from an Eastern culture, an Eastern, the, the Eastern peoples at the time when God called him out. The nation of Israel is born, the nation of, you know, some people they say when I tell them, well, if you say the Jews, that's not right, you're not supposed to say the Jews because the Jews only reply to Judah. That's how Paul called it, and Paul said that, and there was the tribe of Benjamin as well, and the tribe, of course, the Levites were there in Israel as well, and he called them all Jews, so it's okay. Um, but anyway, both houses are supposed to come back. The house of Israel and the house of Judah, and they're supposed to dwell uh, in peace. No, in other words, no longer at each other's throats. And we do have people from every tribe there in Israel today. They're there waiting for Mashiach to come. They have to be in Israel for him to come. Now Vashti is a type of Israel when Yeshua came, when Jesus was here on earth. And a lot of people say, well, that can't be. And I had a dear brother that said that to me one time. And of course, I know his view has since changed because when he said it, the Holy Spirit revealed to me right in his dining room what the truth of this was. Because this brother says to me, he says, Brother Steve, he says, Vashti could not be a type of Israel because the king just wanted to portray her, uh, excuse me, por por uh, parade her before a bunch of drunken men. So it couldn't be that type there. Yes, it is. They weren't a bunch of drunken men. Although the scripture does say that all the princes of the province he brought together and they were there and they could drink each man according to his pleasure. Remember, Jesus also drank wine, went to a party, filled up the two barrels of water, turned them to wine as well. Was he at a drunken party? No. But did they drink according to their pleasure? Yes. What was that all about? That was foreshadowing what God was going to do on Pentecost. And that's what the story of Vashti is all about. When the time comes for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, when Yeshua had went up on the cross and died and he had sent his own spirit back, the Ruach HaKadosh, to come back upon the believer, what does he do? They filled the, 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 the upper room, the, the 120 in the upper room. When they came out, they came out staggering. And they began to stammer with their lips. And they said, these men are full of new wine. And then Peter stood up in the midst with about, oh, I don't know, about 20 or 30 nations that were represented there. And said, these are not full of new wine as you suppose they are. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. 
Yes, Vashti typed Israel because what did Israel say? We don't want no part of this. And Vashti said the same thing. And so the king, he did not divorce her, but he removed her from being the queen. And he sent out to look for another bride. And he gathered all the virgins of the land together. That's just like bringing all the churches together. And if you ever noticed what does the king do? He has to bring one after another before him to see which one would find favor with him. That is how Yeshua chooses his bride. Who will find favor with him? And you're going to find out what finds favor with Yeshua in just a second with Esther. I like, I was listening to Sid Roth when he talked about it. He said, you know, she was bathed in oil for a year. Isn't that interesting? It seems like to me then that the bride needs to have a pretty powerful revival right about now. There should be a revival breaking out. But while that revival begins to break out amongst the true Esthers, trouble is setting in the land against Israel. There's in the palace, in those that claim that they are Christians, in the church, there are those that are willing to turn on the king. There's a lot more to this story that God is going to reveal to me. And I know it. I can feel it already. It may not happen here because I'm going to go back. I'm picking up things in my heart already. The Lord dealing with my heart right now. But when he finally finds favor with Esther and she becomes his queen, then guess what? Trouble sets in. Mordecai brings word to Esther. Just like Israel's bringing word to the Christians today. Somebody said to me recently, a dear sister, Sister Mina was telling me because her mother had met Benjamin Netanyahu. God bless you, my sister. She's trying to warn the nation right now of impending judgment that's coming. But Sister Mina, she was telling me that when her mother met Benjamin Netanyahu and he, she was trying to witness to him about Yeshua being Mashiach, Benjamin said to her, there's one thing that I covet among the Christians and that is your prayers. Sister Antoinette, God bless you. And that's exactly what Mordecai does when he comes to Esther. He comes to her the Jew, when he sees that Israel is about to be annihilated. And he comes coveting the prayers of the bride. And he says to her, maybe this is why you were brought to this position for such a time as this. Israel begins to recognize that God does have a bride. And they begin to realize that she will have to go before the king and intercede on their behalf. If you really believe that you are the bride of Moshiach, I adjure you, I beg of you, as a Jew, as one of Mordecai's descendants, as it were, go before the king. You notice that Esther said no one could go before the king unless they're summoned. You wonder about your rapture. Well, let me tell you something. What's going to cause you to have favor in his sight to where he does summon you into his presence is when you're on your knees, when you're praying and you're crying out for Israel. When you take your place as the true Esther of this day. My good friend Lori Cadoza Moore, who's on the front of the battle, the front lines against anti-Semitism, 
You want to support somebody? You want to support a movement if you have a heart that wants to support as well? I mean, there's everybody I know asking for support. That's a worthy cause. Proclaiming justice to the nations. Lori Cadoza Moore, president of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, fights tirelessly against anti-Semitism in every form that there is. God bless her work. And as I close... Let me say this, as I mentioned to you, I think we said it at the beginning of this video here. When Barack Obama in 2010 had Netanyahu in the White House and he tells him you need to think about the error of your ways. And he said, I'm going to go have dinner with my family. And he snubbed the president and walked out upon, or the king of Israel and he walked out on him. He said, think of your ways and I guess when he returned back, they would talk about their ways. Treating a king of Israel like he's a child. Remember I said our way back, the king has to fail. We're on our way back. The next step for Israel to do, as we see that our, pre our king of Israel, Netanyahu, cannot bring peace. He cannot bring the millennium, neither could Solomon bring the millennium. When he stood up as King David, the first time in his running of prime minister. He had blood on his hands, so to speak. You know what's interesting, though? Now he's playing the part of King Solomon. And so building of the third temple will follow his lot. And it's going to be given to the Gentiles, the outer court. They're going to let, our, let us have our temple. Mr. Prime Minister. But unfortunately, just as Solomon ended up backsliding, and I know your heart is troubled at what you're doing, but Solomon never lost his soul for what he did. But the word of God has to be fulfilled. And as a prime minister, you cannot, you won't redeem our people. It's not where Mashiach will come from. Now our people must cry out for Eliyahu. And the funny thing is, is Eliyahu will get Moses and bring him with him. You don't have to cry out for Moses, he'll bring him. Because God knows there's two anointed ones. Even we know that as Jews. We know that Moses is coming back as well. We think it's a millennial reign. But it's just before the millennial reign. So anyway, Obama walks out on Netanyahu. Just like when David had need of provision, he had needed food, and he sent in a ball and requested of him. I know, that, I know that Netanyahu did not request to go to dinner with Obama, but the thing is, it's the type is what I'm looking at here. Nabal said, who is this King David? Everybody thinks they're a king. And he snubbed the king of Israel, the anointed king of Israel. David armed himself and would have destroyed Nabal for what he did. And God would have destroyed this nation for what Obama did if it hadn't have been for Abigail. And Michelle Bachman, you were the type of Abigail that day. When you ran a campaign and you cried out for Obama to repent and to go back and recant his statement against the King of Israel, God bless you for your stand. You were a type of the bride of Mashiach on that day and those that faithfully joined with you. And David did stop. You brought an offering, a love offering. You brought food to him. You brought those things that he had need of in a time that he was needy. We need to remember that today as Christians. Find a way to be sure that Israel has food.
The interesting thing is, though, 10 days later, the ball fell under judgment, and he died. I've often wondered, would the nation, the United States, fall under judgment 10 years later after Obama's words that he said, condemning the King of Israel? I can't say I don't know. There are brothers out there, Brother Chris, Brother Matthew, that have worked on a lot of Bible codes lately that speak of warning and judgment. They've placed my name in these codes, and it seems that everywhere my name falls, it's to warn Israel of the impending dangers that face our people today. And so I have felt more compelled after seeing not just one or two codes, countless codes. I warn my people, if you're Jewish, we need to return home. I need to return home as well. But the financial cost is tremendous. This is one of the reasons why, and I don't say this asking you to do anything for me. If you do anything, do it for my, my brothers and sisters, because I do believe that Yeshua is Mashiach. I believe I should return home as well, but I have a big family. And when that time comes for us to go, we all must go. Be the true Ruth. Help get the people home. Be the true Abigail. Make sure Israel has food. Be the true Esther. Pray for Israel like you've never prayed before in your life. Be a true bride of the Mashiach, Yeshua. By being his bride, you show you're his bride. In all these women's lives, they stood for Israel. And one other thought. They say that the Palestinians have Jewish DNA in them or Hebraic DNA. That is true. Remember we started off this video with? The DNA... By the way, that was found. Or that they say that is in, that is in the uh, that is in there. That is true. It would be true. Because the prophecy of Rebecca of Esau and Jacob prophesies that there will be two states. Esau was Abraham's grandson. And it shows that the Palestinians are descendants of his. And he was half Arab and half Jew in that regard there. So yes, there should be something in there. So I just encourage you today, stand with Israel. We're in a serious, serious, serious hour of this. Thank you.